I'd like to begin this morning by introducing Joan Kimball, our poet for this morning. Joan grew up in Connecticut, and she said back in the 30s, her mother would read to her and her sister's mother Goose and the limericks of Lear and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And they sang with their mother at the piano, hymns and Gilbert and Sullivan. And when she was 14, her father took her to her first Shakespeare play, and she was smitten. And she started reading more of plays and sonnets, and the nuns at her school immersed the students in English poetry every century from Beowulf to Eliot. And she said, lots of memorization and no creativity, but a fire was lit that still burns. And then uh, in her teens, she started writing her own poetry. She put wrenching lines, she said, on little slips of paper and leave it around the house for her mother, who would find it and say nothing, but eventually gave her a book, a little treasury of great poetry. Joan went on to college in her 50s at Smith. Uh, she was a year ahead of the poet Sylvia Plath. That was when she became even more interested in poetry, took courses in fiction writing, and started her own notebook. She got married after graduation, and she tried various hats of work, including English teacher, copy editor, publisher, storyteller, manager of a bookstore. She went on to study library science, and uh, raised two children, and she noted uh, two of her four children born in French-speaking countries of Belgium and the Belgian Congo. And after the days of uh, raising children, and as time went on, uh, Joan noted that in her retirement years, she went more to writing of poetry, both free verse and formal. And she said, it's funny that I never considered trying to publish my poems until nine years ago when she joined a poetry group in Wayland. And she said, now I've gathered a pile of rejection slips, but also acceptances from journals including Atlanta Review, Comstock Review, Raintown Review, and many others. And she's been honored as a finalist for the Southwest Review 2010 and Morton Marr Poetry Prize a finalist for the 2011 Atlanta Review of International Poetry. She's a founding member of Concord Poetry Center, and she's involved with the Pow Wow River Poets of Newburyport, and one of the five members of XJ Kennedy and the Light Brigade. And when I asked Joan why share poetry with others, she said, for family and friends, poetry is communication. Who am I am, and legacy, who I was. Poetry is more accessible than a tombstone. So that, I would like to invite Joan Kimball up to come and share some of her words of poetry. I have some pieces, some are humorous, and some are just to share. I'm going to start with a limerick called The Seventy-Something. The Seventy-Something Spry Cow took her bull by the horns and said, how shall we manage to dance with a splash of romance if we can't get back up when we bow? <laughs> well, actually, I don't know much about cows, but I know about the St. Lawrence River, and I would like to share a a uh, piece with you called Rhymes from a River, which is a word picture of a riverbank with a willow tree on it that has its roots going right out into the water. And you can see these red roots down in the water. <coughs> Rhymes from a River. A stream so full, a swamp seems dry. A dawn, a golden scar. A chain of mallards drifting by, a chain of geese afar. A willow shading bloated spill above a quick mink's wake. A tethered rowboat, not quite still, a glint of water snake. A tree crown shading early light, a red root sucking mud. A sap vein coursing its full height above the river flood. A human touch, the dock protrudes, an angle thrusting out, a wooden stage for solitude, a span to nurture doubt. 
And here's another limerick, which I call Cold October. It's about a strange sight that I saw in a field on a frosty early morning. There were purple thistles, the flowers sticking up like this, and on top of each one was a black and yellow bumblebee just lying there. And I thought they were dead, but I could see they were just breathing, that they weren't moving. And then two or three hours later, when I went back, they were gone. Cold October. Cold October made four hairy bees soporifically lie at their ease, each apparently dead on a thistle stem head until warmed in the sun by degrees. And I want to t talk a little about limericks because they're a lot of fun. Um, they're short, they're just five lines. But there is a place on the internet called the Omnificent English Dictionary in Limerick Form. And this place, O-E-D-I-L-F dot com, <laughs> is uh, a, a place where uh, they are trying to make a limerick for every single word in the English language. <laughs> and not only that, um, common phrases too they'll take. So, um, and, and anybody can submit a limerick there. Um, what you have to do is you, you send in your limerick and then they will workshop it with you. They have editors who will help you to make it just right so that they can keep it in their dictionary. And I actually have 13 there <laughs> that are approved under my pen name, Joan K. J O A N K A Y. And here's another limerick which is at the O E D I L F. About, it's about windsurfing, which is a sport that's also called board sailing because you sail standing on a surfboard. To skim o'er the waves while you stand on a board with a sail may seem grand. But a board sailing ride in light winds that subside might force you to swim for the land. <laughs> now this next, I'm going to talk about a poem that I wrote called This River Hill, which is about a, an island in the St. Lawrence River where um, we go in the summer, and we have a little cabin there. And um, I wrote this poem because uh, I had walked around the island with a geologist, a friend named Richard Young, who sh uh, explained the history of the rocks of the island to us. And I uh, sent him the, uh, this poem, This River Hill, uh, as a thank you for his walking around the island. And about a year later, he sent me a draft of this book. And what he had done was he'd taken my poem, This River Hill, and put his photographs of the island with it. So I'm going to uh, read this to you. It, uh, he and I revised it and published it on um, a place online uh, where you can do your own publishing called Blurb. This River Hill. You can see here that the um, rocks of the island are here and then there's the river behind, St. Lawrence River. Let's see if I can do this right. I step from rock to rock at the water's edge Cold wind flutes across my ear. My heavy shoes le loosen igneous grains to join their fellows on the beach, where bleached shells and pulverized granite attend the river's offering. Float of weed, bloat of bass. Coot feather, cola can, propelled on waves breath through rocky shallows to the insatiable strand. And here's the strand. This island rock, 
This river hill, this eroded base of a mountain peak, proof of epical ordeal, was once higher than Everest. A mile-high glacier bent on decapitating the mountain, grinding, scraping, with granite fingernails, clawed our tender Paleozoic stone. My shoe prints won't last on this beach. Damp scents of soaking roots curl along the sharp shore to a low ledge. Easy leg up, I walk the ancient slab that flaunts its glacial streaks across the shelf. And here you see the streaks. I don't know if you can see this, but there are straight streaks right on that uh, stone that were probably made about 20,000 years ago by the glacier. What Indians walked this river shore long ago whose ancestors left Africa heading east across Siberia, the Pacific, the Rockies, the Great Lakes to meet my forebears whose ancestors left Africa heading west across Mesopotamia, Europe, the Atlantic to fetch up on this river plain. What boulders in the St. Lawrence were dropped by the glacier after scraping our rock rim. Those humpbacked outsized cobbles clumped in a watery course lurk beneath the sky's reflection. They're the bane of the keel boats. I've bumped them myself with my centerboard. Now I wander rudderless along the wave-dampened sand and wind-dried shale. I hunt the glacier's longevous traces and find its spoor on our Cambrian coast. I am the rover. I am the witness invoking the ghosts of ancestors and ice. And now I'm going to talk about an animal that's up at that island, uh, an otter. I call this otter's claim uh, because the otter has the island to itself in the winter. We uh, have to take a boat in order to get to the island, and uh, when it, uh, the, uh, island, the river freezes over in winter with ice, we can't get out there, so it's the animal's domain. And the otter likes to eat mussels. Mussels are a type of clam, and uh, after it gets the meat out of the shell, it throws the shells down and tends to throw, eat and throw shells down in one pile in one place. So when you come back to the river, you will see a pile of these white shells, uh, knowing just where the otter was. And the shells have mother of pearl on the inside, which I call, which um, I refer to as it's, it's called nacre, so I refer to them as nacreous in this. Otters claim, below the dock we spot a mound of shells wave winking from the river mud, an otter's winter forage. We'd left the bay before November's horizontal winds could harry us and dash our boat against the ice-clad cleats. The creature must have scavenged far along the ragged bottom to snatch its fare and shuck these nacreous lids. It must have climbed many frost-white mornings, fur dripping, muscle in mouth, to sit here upon the wharf, to skim these husks, to sample the empty riverscape. Now let's change the subject. This next is called Consider the Rest. It's in two parts. In the first part, any resemblance to the mummy of the Egyptian king Tut is purely intentional. <laughs> Consider the rest. 
His pickled lungs and liver sealed in jars, a golden replica upon his face. I can't forget that king whose pious vizier stashed him with spoils to buy eternal life. The undertaker dressed my aunt in velvet. Her nails were varnished red, tight curled her locks, and just before they sealed the satin lid, her daughter dropped aunt's charge cards in the box. <laughs> Is there a life after death? <laughs> well, many of us think so. And I imagine what it might be like in this, which I call, It Will Happen. Uh, this isn't really a funny poem so much as it is a happy poem. It will happen. On a Wednesday, it will happen. And when I die, I will be young again. I will have horn concertos and offer my bones to the herring merchant. And when all rise in their coffins to greet me, I will dance on branches of palm, tracing the shadows of my unborn cousins. And I will sing aloud to the clouds and waves that I am free to hold them in my arms, that Joan Kimball is dead and no machine can bind her, and no medicine can drown her. Now, let's change the mood. I'm going to give you one more limerick here um, that's at the O-E-D-I-L-F. Um, in, I'll explain a little bit, in 2009, I was scheduled to read with Bob Clausen and some others. We were going to read our humorous poetry at the Massachusetts Poetry Festival when Bob emailed us saying he didn't think he could make it because he was on Nantucket Island and they had just uh, uh, declared a storm, a really major storm coming and the ferry was going to shut down. So I was really upset. And to console myself, I wrote this limerick. When the weatherman forecast a gale, the ferryman's visage turned pale. He canceled the trip, stranding Bob at the slip. It's too bad that he can't book a whale. <laughs> and my final piece is back at the St. Lawrence River. I call this geese in September. Two geese yapping nonstop, flying low over wind-racked water, paired for life this old wing couple, barking for Florida, bitching about the trip. <laughs> Why go so early? We'll hit the hurricanes. Flap it up, can't you? Too many tourists. Let's wait a month. Let's not. And so on until they're out of sight. Thank you. <laughs>
and softened my waist with berries and honey, though porridge has never been my thing. The forest is out there. Sometimes I hear it breathing. In spring, it whispers all season long. In winter, it groans. A woodcutter lives nearby. He also has been disappointed in love. Occasionally, he drops by with faggots for my fire, and I pay him handsomely. He's the one keeping the paths clear, in case there is another story. <laughs> and this poem is inspired, as many of my poems are, by watching birds. Origami, head of the meadow beach. Triangle heads, triangle <clears throat> wings, collapse into the folds of the waves swallowed by and swallowing the silver glint of scale falling from a turn's beak. Fold of black crest, fold of sharp orange bill, fold of wing, tucking a keepsake into a pocket. The air above the dunes is a shaken out sheet of paper, crisscrossed by folds, nest folds, folding into sand, unborn bird still folded into egg, the tiny beating hearts, paper valentines. Crisp wisp of bird, angular bones, your body folds up my thought, takes it over the water, sends it tumbling, its little love letters pelting the surface, envelopes unopened, their folded words. Thank you. This is a song that I, I named for my grandfather. Walk 
me home, Charles Henry. The night is sweet. Breathe in the air. Slow down your feet, for the stars are diamonds in the street, and the years are bends in the road. Walk me home tonight. Walk me home, walk me home tonight, walk me home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Poetry is nothing much. A flickering light in the dusk. A rusty blaze along the trail. A granite ledge and a steaming mug of tea. An eve to ease the pelting drops. A proffered hand. Rainbows arcing between storms. A healing art. Poetry is the sum of simple parts. <laughs>